Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of Portsmouth City Council's Cabinet. I'm Councillor Steve Pitt, Leader of the Council, and I'll be chairing this meeting. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. If the continuous fire alarm sounds, it is not a drill, so please evacuate the room and public gallery via the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble at Queen Victoria's statue in Guildhall Square. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. Everyone speaking via a microphone will be recorded and broadcast on the website including those making deputations, of which today there are none. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they have finished. We have all read the reports, so officers please highlight any developments that have occurred since publication or anything that you think is key to the report. Um, I understand that there aren't any deputations, so uh, I'll go around the table to start with, doing introductions, turning to Natalie. Thank you, Leader. Natalie Bromer Pearl, Chief Executive. Uh, Peter Bove, City Solicitor. Anna Martin, Democratic Services. Chris Ward, Director of Finance. Matthew Williamson, Cabinet Member for Community Wellbeing, Health and Care. Kimberly Barrett, Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Greening the City. Uh, Susie Horton, Cabinet Member for Children, Families and Education. Darren Sanders, Cabinet Member for Housing and Tackling Homelessness. Yeah, Councillor Lee Hunt, Resources. And Dave Ashmore, uh, Cabinet Member for Environmental Services. Thank you, Cabinet. Uh, we have officers presenting today. Claire? Claire Looney, Culture, Legend, Regulatory Services. Mark Collings, Seafront Operations Officer. Mark Sage, Tackling Poverty Coordinator. Thank you all and welcome. Uh, we have no press with us today. Um, apologies for absence received from Councillor Ian Holder, who due to the shift nature of his work is actually on shift today and unable to join us. Councillor Vernon Jackson, who is on annual leave, and Councillor Hugh Mason, who is attending a funeral. Uh, item two on the agenda is declarations of interest. Members, are there any declarations? No one is indicating. Thank you. Uh, item three, record of previous decision meeting on the 3rd of October. Members, are we happy to accept those as an accurate record proposed by Councillor Lee Hunt and seconded by Councillor Darren Sanders? Thank you both. Item four is our update on the cost of living and household support fund provision. And it's Mark Sage, our tackling poverty coordinator, who is presenting. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, so it's a report uh, to provide an update on the work against the Council's priority to improve lives by helping residents with the cost of living. Um, and that includes round four of the Household Support Fund grant, which is funding for local authorities from the Department of Work and Pensions to provide local welfare assistance to residents in financial hardship. Um, so in Portsmouth, there are four main principles that we apply in, in using that funding. One is to make full use of the funding that's available to us from the government. The second is to fund a range of provision to meet different needs. Thirdly, we target assistance to those missing out on other forms of support. And the fourth thing is to provide a holistic offer of support and advice. Um, there are two big differences in Household Support Fund round four to previous rounds. The first is that we received a full 12 months funding rather than six months, which was welcome. The second part was a requirement from the Department for Work and Pensions that we make significant part of, pun of the fund available for customers to apply to, so a different method of delivering that support. Uh, that meant that we couldn't continue to deliver Household Support Fund within our existing resources, so we've set up a new Household Support Fund delivery team. We now have support provided by teams across the council, so the new delivery team is sitting in housing, neighbourhood and building services, working closely with the cost of living support worker in the public health team and with the cost of living helpline and online hub teams, which are in corporate services, alongside voluntary sector support from Hive Portsmouth. Um, so in September, the team launched the first two application-based schemes. Uh, that was the family vouchers and the cost of living payment schemes, which are still live and uh, receiving lots of applications, which is great. Um, we are setting up further schemes to support people over the autumn and winter, including a discretionary exceptional hardship fund that can support those missing out on other schemes. Um, 
It's important to note that the teams delivering this support are all temporary posts funded by Household Support Fund grant. So whether that support can continue next year, next financial year from April, depends on decision from the government of whether to provide any further Household Support Fund grant. That decision is expected in the autumn budget statement, which is the 22nd of November. If no further funding is provided by government, that will have a severe impact on our ability to support residents um, around the cost of living. So the report notes continuing pressures on household budgets, even as the inflation rate starts to reduce a bit, especially around the costs of food, energy, housing, and the cost of debt. Um, the public health teams created a cost of living dashboard, which helps us to track the impact for residents. And that information is now published as part of the council's joint strategic needs assessment. So residents and partner agencies can all access that data now. And in addition, we have the Director of Public Health's annual report, which this year focused on poverty and the cost of living and provides a really detailed needs assessment to guide our work going forward. So those next steps really are for the Household Support Fund team to continue developing and delivering local welfare support, including developing a plan for next financial year after the autumn budget announcement makes clear what resources will be available for that. Um, and that will be one aspect of a renewed and refocused Tackling Poverty Steering Group and Action Plan, which will use the Director of Public Health's uh, report as the evidence base for the next phase of the work around tackling poverty and action on the cost of living and providing local welfare support to residents. So the work will continue to report into Cabinet and to the Health and Wellbeing Board, which provide the overall political and strategic leadership for the work. Um, all of that work really to tackle poverty and to improve the well-being of our residents. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions or if there's any other information that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, just like to place on record uh, the Cabinet's thanks to you and uh, your new team uh, for all the work that you've been doing and uh, getting that money out there to the people who really need it. So thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Susie Orn. Yeah, just to start off by echoing that, um, Councillor Pitt, thank you to Mark and your team for everything you've been doing. Um, at the risk of repeating myself over the last few years, I will still call this the not enough fund. It's not enough to be dealing with the cost of living crisis that we're facing. Um, and I think the question around future funding is a really serious one for us to consider. To um, we, We're always waiting on the next bit of government money, but the cost of living um, crisis is not abating very quickly. So that question has to you know, stay high in our, in our minds about what we will do um, with the money that we're given, um, especially fearing some kind of cliff edge. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud of what we've done in Portsmouth is right from the word go, um, even under the previous models, we were very mindful of the not quite poor enough. And that is something that we've, and we've really tried to um, use the money as creatively as possible to, to meet the needs of those people. And this last um, iteration has, has managed to lean into that, but we'd, we started the groundwork um, way earlier. So thank you again to Mark and his team. Um, and I suppose the main point that I want to say is, and again, this is repetition, but we had a lot of really good stuff in place. We had um, a lot of um, some of the early help work that we've done, both in adults and children's, but also um, the, um, the stuff that we've done in housing around young people and the outreach that has come through, for example, the adventure playgrounds, etc. We've got a really good network of understanding um, our residents, notwithstanding the fact that I'm sure all of us come across a case at least once a week where someone has slipped through the net, and that's why we need to remain vigilant. Um, and the last point, and Mark kind of uh, highlighted it, but what I'm really um, pleased about is how this is central to the Health and Wellbeing Board and that it's, um, it's become an in incredibly prominent and important part of um, our strategic work across the Council. Councillor Winnington, please. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Steve, and uh, thanks, Mark, for the report and, uh, again, for all the work you're doing. And I'd just like to pick up on uh, Susie's last point there about how this fits in with the Health and Wellbeing <coughs> Board and the Health and Wellbeing Strategy in particular, and has been brought out uh, about the uh, Public Health, um, Director of Public Health report this year. Um, obviously, I also sit as the co-chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board, 
Um, and we are very unusual in the city that we have a health and wellbeing strategy uh, which uh, is on the causes of the causes, and that indeed is mentioned in the report. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the bits in this report from 3.2.10 to 3.2.16, um, it really does cover about those ways that we work across portfolios, across agendas on the council, but also, of course, the Health and Wellbeing Board is a body which uh, has many members from outside the council. And we are, um, again, an unusual Health and Wellbeing Board because we have, the, uh, we have incorporated into the Health and Wellbeing Board our Children's Trust Board and our Safer, Safer Portsmouth Partnership. <clears throat> so we are able to do things on a much more holistic way. Um, and it's this kind of work that we have done as an administration over the last five and a half years, which has enabled us to not just have a strategy that does this kind of thing in the way we can work across portfolios, but it's also the way that we can also work across different organisations in the city, uh, because we are prominently putting forward integration, and it is by doing that that we can really make this work. But <coughs> as Councillor Halton has, has, has said, um, the money we get for this kind of thing is not enough. Uh, and we constantly have to battle against central governments, um, ignoring a lot of these issues um, and actually making things more difficult for our people who are in poverty in this city and at the risk of falling into poverty. Um, so we do what we can do and we do it very well. Um, and, uh, but we can always do better and we can always make sure that we keep this as a focus um, going forwards. And I'm really pleased that not only is the Director of Public Health's report based on this this year, looking at those causes of the causes, as is mentioned in 3.2.13, um, but is also focused on ways that we can do things better um, which is something we're looking to do more and more of within the Health and Wellbeing Board, including looking at what we call vulnerable. It's not a great word, but the more, most vulnerable in the city to make sure that we can give a holistic response to that <coughs> rather than the piecemeal things. And as uh, Susie said again, where people fall through the cracks. And if we can stop that happening, then we are doing um, the job that we should be doing. Thank you, Matt. Councillor Lee Hunt. Yeah, it's really good that we should um, look at those people who might fall through the cracks. And this was a focus of our, um, our um, uh, discussions prior to this meeting. And we don't want that to happen, we want to help people. But <laughs> the real issue, and, and Councillor Horton put it much more kindly than I will, is that the um, government... Uh, uh, cuts to universal credit. Uh, there's no. Th that's what's at the root of a lot of this. And 100,000 people are going to fall into absolute. An additional 100,000 people are falling into absolute poverty as a result of uh, what this government did. But they blame everybody except themselves, and they're looking for even more cuts to benefits as we go into the future. And. Um, they want to blame the. Uh, they want to blame the public sector, rises in the public sector, inflation. Everybody except for them darn selves, for failing to look after people, and it's all right for them. You know, they go off and have lovely holidays and enjoy all the benefits of private health care and private dentistry and all sorts of other th other other things. Yet they plunge more and more people into poverty, more and more children, um, all suffering. And the cut of £20 to universal credit was a very big, uh, uh, it was not a progressive, was it? You know, it's a backward step. So yeah, I blame them uh, for all these people who are facing terrible trouble at the moment over electricity, bills, cost of living which we're addressing today and the amount of money that Mark is trying to uh, spread wisely to those who need it the most um, if only they had left their universal credit alone instead of doing it in this way and making people bid for money and jump through hoops and 
spend all sorts of money on red tape and bureaucracy and so on. It's all a complete waste of time. Um, and goodness knows why they do it. And the sooner that they're gone, the better. Hey, hey. Councillor Sanders. Thank you very much, um, Steve. Many of the people who benefit from this live in our council accommodation and live in our council homes. A third of council tenants are on in work benefits. So that means they're in work, but they don't earn enough to not be on some form of some form of benefit tax credits or whatever. And, and Lee's right. These are the people who are suffering disproportionately, and that's why it's great that this package disproportionately helps them, because too often they get ignored. Um, I think that for them, some of the issues, it's not purely universal credit. It's just some really simple things the government can do to change things that will actually save money in the longer term. Um, every, I understand every new council home that's built saves the equivalent of £780 in housing benefit. So in other words, it drives costs down for central government. And I understand that they need to drive costs down. Um, in terms of uh, providing extra, in terms of raising the local housing allowance or housing benefit in jargon, just from just to the 30th percentile, that will actually save money. It will also mean, as we're finding out across the UK, that more council homes will be built, which will save housing benefit even more. So I agree with Lee. I think what's missing is a joined up, holistic, integrated approach that puts people first. That's, that is in this package, which is very pleasing. Uh, it's got to continue. I, I worry if the Chancellor pulls the plug on all this on the 22nd of November, because I get a feeling we're all going to have a meeting on the 23rd of November, going, what on earth do we do? Uh, but we have to look after people, and we are in a way that the government should follow. Thank you, Steve. Yes, I think, like colleagues, I've got zero confidence whatsoever the government's going to do the right thing in the autumn statement, because the government hasn't done the right thing in any statement, uh, in my uh, recent memory at least um, and the, the, you know, the ultimate irony with this vital amount of money that does support those who need it the most is that they haven't even increased that with inflation yet all they talk about is inflation so you know it's it's not good enough and we're trying to make effectively less go further uh, every single time uh, and some of the issues that uh, Councillor Sanders has highlighted there about failing to address uh, other issues that we have around um, the local housing authority cap, etc., are just frankly nonsense um, because the government should not need us to sit here in Portsmouth and point out the bleeding obvious to them about how disconnected they are and how much they're not talking to each other. Um, it's not at all helpful uh, and uh, it causes me a huge amount of grief every single day when I have to read the nonsense letters that they keep sending out telling us what to do um, and if they only took their own advice the world might be a better place. Um, sadly they won't. Um, any other comments on this item? Thanks again Mark and the team and um, just one thing before you do go uh, you'll not be surprised that I ask this um, in terms of the amount of food that we've allocated for the food banks the larders and the pantries etc um, uh, th is that proving to be sufficient to date um, oh, yes that is on sorry um, yes uh, so far it is we, we haven't we haven't uh, allocated all of that yet but yes there is there is more demand there I mean the the food banks and pantries are having to you know, they do a huge amount of fundraising and, and bringing in their own resources and putting that into providing assistance. So yes, th that alone in the household support fund wouldn't be enough, but luckily we have a really, really strong voluntary sector in the city that, that do you know, an amazing amount of work as well. So uh, together at the moment that is, um, but yes, that's something we have to keep under review uh, within the budget. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And a timely reminder that if it wasn't for our VCS, um, particularly in the way that they st stood up and alongside us during COVID, with this city would be in a real mess. Um, so uh, we also extend our grateful thanks to them for the role that they play day in, day out, supporting people who really need their help. Thank you very much for bringing that update to us today. Uh, we'll expect another one in due course, hopefully after a more positive autumn statement than any of us dare for. Um, <coughs> Item 5, Water Safety Management Policy, and that's Mark and Claire to present. Councillor Pitt, thank you very much. Um, we welcome the opportunity to bring this draft Water Safety Management Policy to Cabinet for consideration. The city is very unique in being the UK's only island city, and yet we currently have not had a Water Safety Management Policy, in part because there is no legislation requiring us to have one. 
We had expected, following the tragic accident at Canberra Sands in West Sussex, where a number of people lost their lives, the legislation to be changed. And in fact, we have been preparing for that change of legislation, but as it hasn't materialised, we felt it was an opportune moment to bring our own policy together for your consideration. We believe that it's important that we are delivering to the best practice we possibly can, both in terms of beach safety management, which is one considerable aspect of our offer, but also in terms of consideration of that wider inland water areas, such as Baffin Pond and other areas of the creeks and areas like that all around the island city. The context of the report gives you an outline of what we've done with a specialist, and I'm going to pass over to Mark to answer any specific questions you might have in terms of the approach that we've taken or the aspects that are up for consideration before we take it out for that wider consultation piece. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, <clears throat> if I could just elaborate uh, slightly on some of the things that, that Claire said there. Um, as Claire referenced, Portsmouth, unique in its island city status, um, surrounded by water. Um, and most of that coastal interface is uh, the direct responsibility of the council across a number of different directorates. Um, we also have a number of inland water bodies, uh, obvious ones being Canoe Lake, Baffin's Pond, Hillsy Lines, um, and a few other smaller ones hidden away. Um, the water safety management policy um, has been developed as a result of an internal audit um, as well, which I'm pleased to say was acknowledged that PCC uh, is uh, effect managing its water space effectively, um, but it was highlighted that we didn't have an overarching document um, of which we now um, have. Um, the policy establishes a foundation for managing all council open water environments um, by the relevant directorates and will uh, enhance the reputation of the council in regard to water safety. Um, appendices two and three are the risk assessment packs for coastal and inland water zones. Um, as part of developing this policy, all zones were visited by uh, myself and Cliff Nelson from Atlantic Crest, who's a renowned water safety consultant. Um, these risk assessments include some recommendations which we propose to put forward to the members of the, uh, to, to members of the PCC hosted Water Safety Forum, uh, which includes representatives from key water safety expert bodies such as the RNLI, uh, Maritime Coast Guard Agency, as well as local water sports and volunteer organisations. Um, this will form the consultation. Following that process, we would look to return to Cabinet with an amended policy and action plan. Um, one other item we just wanted to highlight uh, was PCC's education programme, uh, which is referenced in the document. Um, this currently involves us working with the RNLI in visiting primary schools for Meet the Lifeguard sessions, of which we had a really uh, strong uh, response from Portsmouth Primary Schools. Um, and we would like to extend this to secondary schools um, too, which is a slightly tougher um, ask, but um, something that we're keen to, to work with various bodies in order to do. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, it, this is an, an important policy because um, in, even um, looking back to this summer and the events in Bournemouth, um, it's having a, a one document that captures all of the issues to make sure that nothing's falling through the cracks and that we're very aware of where all those risks are and regularly updating um, our view on them um, is crucial. Um, just a couple of things uh, from me before I go over to uh, Cabinet colleagues for comments. Um, in the discussion around the report, it was brought up that the um, we, didn't, we wanted to make sure we weren't leaving university students out of the information when you were talking about secondary schools, because a lot of them come from all over the country, from inland destinations that may not be near any significant body of water, and therefore, you know, they might think that the sea is the harmless place that you can go charging into, but as we know, we've got um, r rapid uh, water, I'm not articulating myself at all well, riptides, that's what I'm trying to say, uh, just off the beach in Portsmouth, and that therefore um, can be very dangerous if you don't know that it's, it's what to expect and, and how to behave in that circumstance. So we raised this, Councillor Horton and I attended a meet, meeting with the Vice-Chancellor and we raised this, um, and uh, he took that on board and said that he would make sure that was fed back and we offered to collaborate if, if that would be useful. Uh, and the second thing is just something really to, to point out that a lot of people I don't think appreciate, and that is that Portsmouth City Council pays the RNLI to provide the cover that they have down on the seafront during the summer. They're not there 
independently of us. They're there in working with us, um, but we we pay for their contract, don't we? Yeah, they're nodding for those who are not on camera. Um, okay, that's it from me. Uh, any members, any comments? Councillor Hunt. Yeah, I <clears throat> just want to emphasise what's been said and what you, follow up what you said, Leader, because um, even though we're in a city, so many kids don't know how to swim. You know, when I was at school, we were, we were taught how to swim, but I don't think that happens anymore. Uh, we've got Charter Academy here, which is a very good facility, of course. But kids need to understand what, how dangerous the water can be. And we work very hard at this, and it's glad to see we'll be doing even more. But, um, and so going to secondary schools is uh, something I'm sure we all support. Well, I know we support. But also, you're quite right, the university students, when they've had a drink, often people take risks and if they don't understand or at least we haven't informed them of, of the risk um, they take uh, uninformed risks and you know when I was representing Central South Sea Ward within I think six months we had um, a couple of students died uh, one ended up in the drink after getting drunk um, and he unfortunately died and then soon after that another another lad uh, went on to the railway line and was electrocuted to death and we don't want this. Um, and since we took action there around um, drinking establishments, it was that time. Um, this has been um, nothing like that has happened since. So always improving our safety and most grateful to Claire and her team for bringing this report forward. It is an important. And who knows how many lives or a life might be saved out of what we've done today. So it's very welcome. And um, we shall never know, of course, if it saves a life, but certainly we're doing everything we can to make sure that we do. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hunt, and for uh, giving me the opportunity to remind people that Portsmouth is one of the few local authorities left in the country that provides free swimming to the under-12s. Uh, anyone else for anything else? No. So we're seeking um, through the recommendations that approval is given for the wider distribution of the draft water safety management policy for consultation members. Is that agreed? Yes. And we're also look, uh, seeking that following consultation, the strategy will be reviewed following receipt of any responses and brought back to Cabinet at a future date for adoption. Is that agreed? Thank you all very much indeed. Mark and Claire, thank you very much for all your efforts on this. Mark, and in particular, thank you for trawling all over the city, making sure that this is complete. Thank you. Members, that concludes today's meeting. Thank you.